recording, Sara Lee. <laughs> I'm assuming that's Sara Lee and family. I hope so. Hi, Linda. Good morning, Good morning. to you. This morning, Catherine, it's good to see people joining us this morning. Our service today will include communion, so if you haven't already and you want to participate, please go and get yourself a little bit of bread and either some wine or some juice so you can join with that later on in the service. Today, Ernie will be leading our worship for us and I would like to tell you about something else that Ernie's going to be doing later in the week. On Wednesday, he will be leading us with a Zoom Bible study. Um, it will be a first, and I'm really, really grateful to Ernie for taking this on. Um, what will happen is that on Monday, at some point during Monday, we will circulate a, a link to a YouTube video which Ernie has prepared, and that will have um, some... Bible Society um, resources and give us something to think about and then on Wednesday evening at 7.30 we will have our Zoom meeting and we'll be, have a chance just to discuss as a group what we've seen on the video. So that's two parts, starting Monday, concluding on Wednesday evening and we'll be sending links out for anyone that wants to join in. If you're not on our church circulation list and you would like to be, please send me a personal message through Facebook or you can send it to pastor.gatehouse at gmail.com and we'll be happy to send you a link so that you can get involved. Um, something else that I would like to mention to you is that AOG is having a one-day online uh, um, I was going to say a seminar, a conference this Thursday, that's the 7th, it's just from 10 till 12 and if you want to participate in that I've sent out a link to the AOG GB YouTube channel. If you go onto that and subscribe you will get the information when it's available. I think that will be a really good two hours and very very well worthwhile. Right, I, with no further ado I'm going to hand you over to Ernie. Good morning, everyone. Let's open in prayer. Heavenly Father, this morning, as we come and gather in your name, we may not be able to gather in the way we would wish, but we can still gather through the wonders of modern technology. And this morning, as we praise and worship you, we ask that all that we offer to you is acceptable in your sight. And Lord, we ask you to send your Holy Spirit upon us that we might hear all that you have to say in our hearts. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I brought some words this morning that come from the prophet Isaiah, but I'm going to read them from Matthew chapter 12. These words were fulfilled in Jesus. Here is my servant whom I have chosen, the one I love in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will proclaim justice to the nations. He will not quarrel or cry out, no one will hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smouldering wick he will not snuff out, till he leads justice to victory. In his name, the nations will put their hope. That's our Lion of Judah. 
morning John chapter 6 verses 1 to 15 there is as usual a video for the children um, short on vacation again with a crowd not social distancing so John 6 1 to 15 sometime after this Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee that is the Sea of Tiberias and a great crowd of people followed him because the, they saw the signs that he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming towards him, he said to Philip, Where should we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have one bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far would that go among so many? And Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled twelve baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, 
Surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. you Ernie for that. I'd just like to say to anyone that's joined us a wee bit later than the very beginning, it, I know it always takes a wee while to get tuned into these things, just a big big welcome to anyone joining us today, um, whether for the first time or whether you've become a regular for these live stream services. It's lovely to see so many people participating and we really really hope that what we do in our own small way here in Gatehouse will minister to you and help sustain you 
through these quite difficult and extraordinary times. At our all-age all service last week, we had a look at that verse about the need to be like salt in order to bring out all the God flavours in the world around us. We saw that salt was an essential commodity in the New Testament world of the Middle East. And today we return to our study of John's Gospel. And it's another essential item that Jesus uses to signpost us to his truth. Bread. There's been a lot of bread making going on, hasn't there? It's lovely seeing all the pictures and I just wish that I had some kind of smelly vision where I could actually smell those beautiful aromas as well. Thankfully, Alison makes a little bit of bread, so I do get some quite pleasant aromas here at home. But I must say, when I look at some of those pictures on Facebook, I feel quite envious. You may remember from previous weeks that John's Gospel views physical miracles as signposts to spiritual truth. And apart from the resurrection, the feeding of the 5,000 is actually the only miracle that's in all four Gospels. So this morning we'll look first of all at what was going on physically and then we'll take a look at what it's showing us spiritually. So first let's have a look at the physical circumstances. Did you notice that in verse 4 of our reading it says that the Jewish Passover was near? That gives a clue as to the amazing impact Jesus' ministry was having and it sets the scene for his teaching. You might have expected everyone to be busy preparing for the Passover celebration, but instead they dropped everything to pursue Jesus. Just imagine if I ordered a, organised a special service when everybody was wanting to do their Christmas shopping. Or if I tried to arrange a conference at that really busy time of year leading up to Christmas. Well, it must have been a little bit like that, that people just dropped everything. I went following Jesus. In the previous chapter, we saw how he had healed a man who had been paralysed for 38 years. And we know from the other Gospels that this was just one of many occasions when Jesus had healed people. He was healing so many people and doing so many amazing things. And it was even more interesting than getting ready for the biggest celebration of the year. And people pursued him in their thousands. Wherever he went, so went the crowd, because they wanted to see the next miracle. Just like some people today want to be the first to share any news item on social media, they probably look forward to going home and amazing others with what they'd seen. But some there had a more sinister agenda. Did you notice at the end of the reading there were some who intended to come and force Jesus to become their king? Yes, these were politically unsettled times and others in that crowd may well have been there with an appetite to see a bit of trouble, perhaps the start of an uprising against the Roman authorities. Verse 10 says that there were 5,000 men there. But most people deduce from this that the actual crowd was much, much bigger than this, that the boy with the loaves and fish wasn't the only child present and that the crowd size would be doubled by all the women and children. So, unlike the other gospel writers, John included that little conversation with Philip when Jesus asked him, where should we buy bread for these people to eat? And John adds that he asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind 
what he was going to do. We're still looking here at the physical, but John's already signposting us toward the spiritual. With the benefit of hindsight, John could see how conscious Jesus had been of the imminent Passover celebration and that he wanted to use this as a teaching opportunity both for the crowds and for his disciples. And no doubt for us too. At the time, Philip could only see a physical problem. People needed to be fed. And it looks like he did some quick mental arithmetic and gave a totally logical answer. It would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each person even to have just one bite of bread. Andrew was more pragmatic though and true to form as patron saint here in Scotland he looked around the crowd and then went back to Jesus to tell him, there's a wee laddie here with five loaves of bread and two wee fishes. But like Philip, he could see that was never, ever going to be enough. How far will that go among so many? There's a really important point here for our own faith. How easy it would have been at the start of this COVID-19 crisis to look even at the local implications of the pandemic as far too big. Too much for us to do anything to improve the situation. Food shortages, curtailed public transport, furloughed workers on reduced income, self-employed people unable to earn a living, schools closed, Vulnerable people told to self-isolate for 12 weeks. As we looked at ourselves and our own limitations, how easy it would have been to wring our hands and say, how much can we possibly do when there are so few of us and the problem is so big? Or... We could have done what, according to the other Gospels, the disciples wanted Jesus to do. Send the crowds away so they could go to the villages and buy food. Not our problem. Let them fend for themselves. Get the council or the government to deal with it. But I believe that when God's church is faced with such problems... Exactly the same spiritual processes are at work as we see in today's passage. It says that it was in order to test Philip and his faith that Jesus asked him, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? Situations such as we face now test absolutely everyone. We're all in this together. But for Christians, they are a test of our faith and the faith of all God's church. Will we prove ourselves faithful to his call? Will we act in a manner which proves that we really do trust our faithful God? Even before lockdown, we'd been listening to government advice and had stopped our TGB activities. For those who don't know, that's the things we do in the community here. Then, on the Sunday morning before lockdown, Sarah Lee, our TGB project coordinator, came to me with some thoughts as to how we could best utilise her time now that number one was closed. It was clear that although others in the community were already doing a lot, there was still so much that we could contribute to this community effort as a church and as TGB Gatehouse. We set aside some funds and Sarah Lee went off to the cash and carry with a big list of what was needed to provide emergency food packs and children's activity packs. She and her team were quickly mobilised. But we knew that the money we'd set aside wouldn't go very far. And we had no idea how long this crisis would last. But we also 
felt the confidence to step out in faith because we knew that in the past, wherever we've stepped out in faith, believing in God's call and entrusting in him, he has provided. And just as we've seen how that wee laddie donated his packed lunch of five cheap barley loaves and two fish, people from right across our amazing community came forward with their offers of help. TGB has received generous gifts of money and food. And then, without us even asking, the council contacted us with the offer of a generous grant from the Scottish Government's Hardship Fund to help us maintain this initiative. But here's the point, and it highlights a really important principle, a practical principle for our Christian faith that we all need to understand. None of this, none of it would have happened without taking those first steps of faith. It might have felt more prudent and responsible to, like Philip, do the calculations and then shake our heads and say, how far will that go among so many? But we needed the faith to recognise God's call and to be ready to step out and do what he had laid on our heart to do and to trust him to go with us. I'm under no illusions about this. We're just one tiny church in a wee town in Galloway. And I'm really humbled to hear stories of much bigger initiatives right across the globe at the moment, many of them in the name of Jesus. We're humbled when we realise that we're part of a massive worldwide response of Christian love for others. You know, when that wee laddie gave up his packed lunch, Jesus took it and he gave thanks for it and he began to distribute it. And there was more than enough for everyone. Or was there? Was there? So far, we've dealt with the practical considerations. But let's look now at the spiritual John wanted us to understand that this miracle was signposting us to spiritual things. Physically, those crowds would soon be hungry again. And if they thought that that was all it was, and that maybe Jesus would provide more, they were going to end up disappointed. We really need to align our own expectations with God's will and kingdom purposes. Otherwise, we'll never, ever be truly satisfied. And when people have false expectations of life, they'll end up just feeling let down and unfulfilled. Some people seem to go through life like that, don't they? They try one thing after another, and none of them lasts for very long. So many people were brought up to go to church, but as they got older, other things drew them away. Maybe they tried other churches, or even other religions. Or perhaps they tried yoga, or alternative spirituality, or mindfulness. And some people wrongly believe that any spiritual food will do. That all religions will lead one day to heaven. But that is totally, totally at odds with what Jesus taught about himself in today's reading. Totally at odds with it. Jesus wanted those listening to him and he wants us to see and to understand that he is actually God's gift to humanity. That for all who truly believe in him, he can offer something at a spiritual level which will always feed and sustain us. Always. And this is where the relevance 
of the Passover becomes clear. Just like the children of Israel that followed Moses into the wilderness, those crowds had followed Jesus into a desert place. And just as God provided manna from heaven, Jesus fed those people. Moses delivered his people from the grip that the Egyptians had on their lives. Jesus wanted to deliver these crowds from the grip that sin had on their lives. The problem was that the crowds couldn't see beyond the physical, the food and the entertainment value of what was going on. Just as we saw on Palm Sunday, they had all sorts of expectations of the kind of Messiah they wanted. But they were blind to the main point of all of this. It was the next day, after Jesus had crossed back to the other side of the lake, that the crowd caught up with him again. And this was when he really challenged their whole way of thinking. In verses 26 to 27, he told them, Very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then, in verse 35, Jesus spoke the first of the seven I am statements that are unique to John's Gospel. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never, never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me and still you do not believe. All those the Father gives me and will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. Then in verse 48, Jesus repeated, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. And here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. We live in a very pluralistic world where anything goes. But Jesus was teaching something completely opposed to that. He, and he alone, is the bread that God provides to feed and to sustain us spiritually. It's only through receiving this spiritual bread that we will inherit eternal life. But there are so many today who have completely the wrong expectations of Jesus. They think that because of his love, anything goes. They pay little or no attention to him and his teaching. But when they face hardship, they want him to wave a magic wand and sort things out for them. And when he doesn't do that, they reject him and all that he taught. The bottom line is that the Christian faith is all about Jesus and not all about us. Back in verse 14, the crowds recognised that Jesus really was the prophet they were expecting. But whereas in Deuteronomy 18.15, Moses had said that when such a prophet came, they should listen to him. The message Jesus brought wasn't the one that they wanted to hear. And when he began to speak about being the bread of life, the symbolism was all too much for them. They wanted more signs and wonders, more entertainment, but Jesus wanted them to start listening to the real point of his coming. 
However, all his talk of being the living bread, about eating that and living forever, was far more than they could swallow. And then, when he alluded in verse 53 to the communion service that we'll be sharing shortly, that just offended them. Very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. This was truly shocking to them. Most of them were incapable of hearing its spiritual truth. And verse 66 tells us that they stopped following Jesus at that point. It feels to me a bit like X Factor. From the thousands who audition in the first place, only 12 acts make it through to the live shows. But in this case, it wasn't the judges who made the selection. It was self-selection. And it looks very much like all of those crowds of people who John described as would-be disciples in verse 60. Only 12 remain by verse 67. And then Jesus turned to those 12 and he asked them, Are you also going to leave? What about us? Are we going to stay the course? Jesus had, of course, been speaking of becoming the new Passover lamb. He knew that one day his body would be broken and shed for them and for us. And of course, he knew that communion would become the way that believers all over the world would come to remember that sacrifice. Only the twelve were beginning to get it. And as we know, even one of them had his own motives and they were the wrong motives. And he would one day betray Jesus. But as Simon Peter acknowledged in verse 68, Jesus in fact had the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. What about you? Do you recognise that Jesus has the words of eternal life? Do you know that he is the Holy One of God? When Jesus asked if they were going to leave too, he was highlighting that we all have that freedom to choose to follow him or to walk away. God never forces us. His greatest desire is for us to do his will. He wants to be in relationship with us. And when we participate in communion, as we symbolically eat and drink his flesh and blood as an act of remembrance, we are showing him our belief and trust in him, our willingness to trust his word, to receive his Holy Spirit and to do his will. God created us with the capacity to understand and to respond to him spiritually, to trust him for our physical provision, but to see beyond that to the truth of salvation and the hope of eternal life. That means that rather than picking and choosing which bits we're going to believe, rather than going with the flow of worldly opinion or personal preference, We are fully committed to a life of discipleship, submitted to his lordship. Are you following him for what you want him to be? And for what you want him to do for you? Are you still wanting him to be something that he's not? Or are you simply allowing Jesus to be the Lord of your life. Now one of the things about these online services is that I can make no assumptions at all about who's hearing this message. 
So I'm going to invite you now, if you, I'm going to ask you if you've ever asked Jesus to be the Lord of your life. It's so easy to do that. All you have to do is to repent, to say sorry for your sins, to accept his forgiveness and to invite him to be the Lord and through his word and spirit to guide you through life and enable you to become the person he always created you to be. While we've still got breath, it's never too late to do that. If you haven't done it before and would like to, or if you feel the need just to renew your commitment, I'm going to read out a short prayer and will then ask you to repeat it after me, line by line. It goes like this. Lord Jesus Christ, I am sorry for the things I've got wrong in my life. I ask your forgiveness and turn now from all that I know is wrong. Thank you for sacrificing your life for me on the cross to set me free from my sins. Please come now into my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and be with me forever. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Now I would ask, I would invite you, if you feel you can say that prayer and really mean it, just say it line by line after me now. Lord Jesus, Christ, Lord Jesus Christ, I am sorry for the things I got wrong in my life. I ask your forgiveness and turn now from all that I know is wrong. Thank you for sacrificing your life for me on the cross to set me free from my sins. Please come now into my life. Please come now into my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. And be with me forever. And be with me forever. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. And if you said that prayer for the very first time today, please message me and let me know. In a moment, we're going to receive communion together. I hope you have some bread and wine or juice ready. The Bible tells us that we should examine ourselves before we share communion. So before I hand over to Ernie, who will be leading us in communion, let's just take a few moments of quiet to examine ourselves before God. We don't often use set prayers in our church because we see prayer very much as a natural conversation with God. But there is a prayer which was very much a part of the Christian tradition I grew up in, which is still used today in many churches every single Sunday. And it seems especially relevant to this morning's message. It's called the Prayer of Humble access the prayer of humble access it's a prayer which acknowledges our fallen and sinful nature and our need for God's grace those of you who've received the words for today's worship will see that you've got a copy of this prayer shall we say it together now and then I'm going to hand over to Ernie we do not presume to come to this your table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your abundant and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord whose character is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. 
Amen. We come to the Lord's table this morning with thankful hearts. We give thanks for Jesus, for all he's done, for his life, for his death and his resurrection. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ His Son. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks. Because he's given Jesus Christ his son. And now let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich. Because of what the Lord has done for us. table this morning. We come with thankful hearts. We give thanks because God has invited us here. All God's children are invited to the Lord's Supper, whatever our age. And all are welcome who know and love Jesus as their personal saviour. We come humbly to the table, knowing that we've not earned our way here, but we're here because we're invited. We need to remember that on the night before Jesus died, he ate with his friends. Jesus took some bread, and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, given for you. Each time you do this, remember me. Let's pray. God of grace, give us repentant hearts, forgiving hearts, clean hearts, with thanksgiving we come to your table. Send your spirit upon us so that we may know that all who eat and drink are one body, one holy people, giving thanks to you in an endless song of praise. Amen. This is the body of Christ broken for you. Let's eat together. We take the cup with thankful hearts. We drink because that same night Jesus also took a cup and after giving thanks, passed it to his friends saying, drink this cup. This cup poured out for you is the promise of God. Whenever you drink it, remember me. Let's pray. God of love, we remember the gift that is Jesus the gift of his birth, of his life, and his death on the cross. And we celebrate his resurrection. And we remember that Jesus will come again. Amen. The blood of Christ poured out for you. Let's drink together. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your unending love. Help us to remember the gift that we have received and to live as brothers and sisters, members of one family, one body in Jesus Christ. And now let the weak 
say I am strong. Let the poor say I am rich because of what the Lord has done. Thank you, Ernie. Thank you. It's so good, isn't it, to join as Christians in sharing the Lord's Supper. And there are hundreds and thousands of people all across the world who've been doing that this morning and will be doing it today. Shall we pray? Father God, your word says that whoever dwells in the shadow of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. There are so many people who know the reality of that this morning. And we come to you now, O oh Father God, with hearts of gratitude. Thank you for your protection over our families and our community. Father, we've seen how fragile the things of this world are, and we put our trust in you this morning, our refuge and our strength. Strengthen us to step out in faith and serve you according to your call and the gifts you've given us. Thank you for strong communities and for the mobilisation of such goodwill in our own community here in Gatehead. We pray for our local businesses and thank you for all who've been able to adapt and reposition their businesses to serve our community. We pray for those unable to work due to the current restrictions and pray your provision for those with much reduced income. Father, your word remind us, reminds us that our hope is in you, our hope in you is firm because we know that just as you share in our own sufferings, so also you share in our comfort. Help us to be ready to share with others the reason for our hope, that they too would know your comfort. Thank you for the devotion of our frontline workers, including health and social care workers, the emergency services, shop workers, delivery drivers and so many more, and for their families. We pray for their continued safety and protection from the COVID-19 virus as they do so much to serve and to protect others. We pray for those in national and local government and for those in our community, the leaders, as they work together to lead us through these difficult times. We pray for those in medical research who work night and day to find a vaccine and treatments for those with the virus. We thank you that we're now past the peak of the outbreak, but pray that the progress will be maintained and we'll be able to avoid a second wave of the virus. Thank you, Lord, for our homes. We pray for all who are staying at home, families, couples, and those on their own. We pray for our children and young people whose lives and education have been so disrupted, some of whom are too young to really understand what's happening, others who are scared because of all the news stories they hear. Protect them, Lord, we pray, and help them enjoy close family times. And Father, we're all too aware of the pressures and stresses of family life, and we pray that families will receive an extra measure of patience with one another. We pray for those who are most vulnerable, especially those in our own church and community, whether living at home, in Fleet Valley, or maybe in hospital and we pray for all those who care for them. Father, you are the great protector, healer and comforter, and we place these loved ones in your care. For those who have been infected, we pray, Father God, that they would know your healing touch and full restoration of health. And for those who have lost loved ones to the virus, draw them close to you 
ease their grief through knowledge of your amazing peace, love and compassion. Help them, Lord, to stay connected with people who love them and care for them. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. When peace like a river attended my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my Lord Thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well. this morning that that is how you are feeling as you watch this this morning that you feel that you are right with God that you are one with him that you feel that your your will and your outlook and your desires and your plans are aligned with his will that you are well with your soul and father we just thank you we thank you for the gift of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for his sacrifice on that cross, that we might be able to eat that spiritual bread forevermore. 
and keep us for all eternity. And now shall we say together the words of the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen. Gail is going to play us out with a song called Worthy is the Lamb. Thank you for joining us today. Hope you can join us next week. And really, if, if any of you would like to join us for our midweek group, watch out for those links that we're going to send out. And as I said earlier, if you would like to have a link and you're not on our normal mailing list, just send me a message and we'll make sure you get that. Thank you. to see you there, you and Kirsty.